I was like, whoa, books are really cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, books are awesome. Talking about spooky stuff. As we do. And we're know. kicking off a new series. As we also do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, this is our It Is Written series. Um, we have done writers in the past. Talked about Mary Shelley. We've talked about Stephen King, Joe Hill, Dean Koontz. Mm-hmm. Um, geez, all, Anne Rice. Yeah. I'm, I know Those are all folks. names we did. <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, no. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot about them for a second. But you're right. We did cover them as well. Yeah. Um, and generally, they were like horror writer staples. Um, mm-hmm. And this series, it is written, so it is written, so it shall be done, is focused specifically on writers where uh, their content is really horrifying. But I wouldn't mm-hmm. say that they're outright horror writers. Yeah, like they're very influential in the field of writing things, um, specifically like kind of like science fiction a little bit uh, for some of them. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, science science fiction, fantasy, like a lot of genre work and not exactly horror, but it kind of exploring otherworldly things or mm-hmm. um, different concepts that tie into real world things. So like the pretty much what we talk about all the time when it yeah. comes to film <laughs> so it fits right in there yeah it's it's horrific the things that take place and the world is horrific in life so it talks about that I think yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually yeah this is our the last time we did writer series I did not do a good job of reading um but this one I'm actually reading all the books and it's very fun mm-hmm. I'm actually like wow I actually like reading who knew yeah um, <laughs> you do, and you do such a great job. And um, I mean, especially these books specifically are so exciting. So um, definitely, if you have not read them, make sure that you do. Um, we just highly, yeah. highly recommend a lot of these. We'll let we you don't know always say that. We don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I'll tell you, I have not met uh, an Octavia Butler book I did not enjoy. Yeah. Just and that's <laughs> a perfect lead into the fact that we're talking about Octavia Butler today. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so something that we're doing for this series uh, is we will have one part uh, that is about the writer, and we'll mm-hmm. be exploring like their life, what kind of works they've done, like the the themes that they often have, the impact they've had on writing, and like the communities that they touch upon. And mm-hmm. then our second part of the episode will be dedicated to a specific work of theirs. So a book or a trilogy or what have you, um, we'll, we'll kind of narrow in on one piece of work and really unpack that with our yeah. media literacy, literacy classes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really see what it's saying. See how much time we have left before it becomes reality. Um, see, <laughs> see lots of stuff. Uh, it's honestly, yeah. Uh, I've only read two of the books so far, but I'm doing it. Um, And they're pretty, in a lot of ways, spot on to a lot of things. And that's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, I read read a lot of these and I'm like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, that's happening. (laughs) This isn't speculative fiction anymore. This is happening already. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, one thing I'll say very much about Octavia Butler is their books, like, really do kind of – they. They are fiction, but also they like give you practical knowledge at the same time. Whereas mm-hmm. like I remember when I was reading Parable of the Sarah, I was like, wow, okay, so these are all things I could be doing right now mm-hmm. <laughs> to prepare for the inevitable, awful that is incoming, slowly yeah. but surely, if not so slowly. Um and yeah, they were like actually educational in a lot of ways, where I was like, wow, there's lots of things that I could be doing 
through just reading this now. Like this is fiction, but it's also very much nonfiction in certain areas of it. So mm -hmm. like it definitely comes from a very educated point of view mm -hmm. and like they know their stuff. And I yeah. think also there's like this part of it where it's like, yeah, we're, we're scaring you, we're entertaining you. And then also we're giving you next, step, next steps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're empowering you to actually do very something about so. it. Um, yeah. Specifically Octavia. So, um, which is like, a big thing that will set her that's that's her her work apart from like when we covered um ira levinson with rosemary's baby or yeah. Seth wives like or just like a little more help <laughs> everything is sad and you just have to live with the fact it's sad Sorry. it's like no actually everything is sad but it's always been sad like everything has always been the worst so you have to do stuff about it to mm -hmm. make it slightly less the worst because it's always some variety of the worst is always going to be happening do something yeah and it's like that for the first step is like acknowledging that mm -hmm. it's the worst and yeah. then the next step is that you do something about it <laughs> so yeah. well, you're just you kind of stopped you start going, you quit. You quit too, yeah. really. So humanity has always been an open sore. We need to put medicine on it. <laughs> Otherwise, well, it'll just die. Um, that's not an option. Which is a prevalent theme in Octavia Butler's work, which will be very yeah. exciting to cover. Um, yeah, and then um, also just before we hop into your section, cat, I do want to uh, apologize to listeners that my neighbors decided right right before we hit record literally two seconds, play music yeah. and do their yard work quite yeah. loudly outside of my window so if you're hearing that i'm so sorry trying to minimize it as much as possible but if you hear it as is the way of living in a city so yeah. <laughs> we're very close to our neighbors is what happens yeah. when human beings exist near you Similarly, a drummer has moved in next door to me. It has not become a problem while recording yet, yes. but it will one day, and I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun. This is, this is part of the job, man. Yes. But we do apologize either way. All right, Kat. Know, let me say words. There. Hello, friends. Uh, <laughs> today we're talking about Octavia Butler, and they're super interesting. Like, genuinely, I don't sound genuine when I say it because it's a problem that I have. Um, but I genuinely mean like they're super interesting. I was like, wow, oh my God, I wish they were still alive because it would have been super cool to meet them. Um, not, I don't know if we ever would have gotten to, but it would have been really cool. <laughs> Um, but I'd like to thank Book Riot for their very thoughtful overview of Octavia and their life. Book Riot had an article titled, Who is Octavia Butler? by Sarah Rahman, and they did a lot of research. They organized this, like, beautifully, honestly. Like, a lot of the information I got from there, it was not only thorough, but um, they really, like, organized it in a very easy-to-understand way that was super interesting. So thank you for creating that, Sarah. Um, but... I want to open with a quote from Octavia Butler that says, I am a 47 year old writer who can remember being a 10 year old writer and who expects someday to be an 80 year old writer. I am also comfortably asocial, a hermit in the middle of Los Angeles, a pessimist, if I'm not careful, a feminist, a black woman, a formal Baptist, an oil and water combination of ambition, laziness, insecurity, certainty, and drive, which I just thought was like, such a fantastic quote because what a great combination of things uh i honestly in my life oftentimes feel like oil and water combination of traits as well so i was like that's so neat yes. and also like someone who wrote as many amazing books to classify herself as lazy i'm like it's like what am i doing then <laughs> i've written zero books and you're killing it you know um, but they, yeah, they're super interesting. Uh, their full name was Octavia Estelle Butler, which I love. I love their middle name so much. Um, their parents were L Larice and Octavia M. Butler. Um, they were born in Pasadena, California on June 22nd, 1947. Um, Octavia Jr. went by Estelle to everyone but her mother, who called her Junie. Um, growing up, her mother worked as a domestic worker and cleaned houses for a living. Uh, Octavia would go to work with her mother sometimes, and they witness their mother being disrespected by their employers. Um, they would feel reasonable anger at witnessing this, but were more frustrated by the fact that their mother didn't stand up for themselves uh, than at the people who insulted them. Um, her mother and her actually bonded a lot over reading, which makes a lot of sense considering that 
Octave wrote like 12 novels. Um, but they bonded a lot over reading, specifically the Bible together. And her mother was very passionate about Octavia's education. Um, her mother would bring her lots of books that she got from places that she worked. This started Octavia's love of books, and she got a library card at the age of six. Octavia had four brothers, all, unfortunately, that died before she was born. And she often wondered what it would have been like if they had lived. Um, she used books as a way to escape and create worlds, spending lots of time in her mind. Uh, this will make a lot more sense later when I get into a lot of why she spent so much time in her mind and how that actually really influenced their love of books. Reading so many books made it easier for her to create stories, spending, as I said, lots of time in her mind. She started to tell herself stories when she was at the age of four years old. But because you don't have the memory that lasts forever. When she turned 10, she wrote a lot of them down so that she would not forget them. And by the age of eight, 13, which will make you feel horrible about yourself, <laughs> at the age of 13, she was sending her stories out to publishers. Um, oh my God. Right? <laughs> right? What a time, Gabe. I was like, all my life, I've never, I've never seen anything I've written. It's just so great. Like, she, she's just so cool, honestly, in reading all of the stuff about her life. Um, but yeah, at 13, she was sending her stories out to publishers. Uh, she did not get any of them accepted, but just like such a cool move, just like confidence. Yeah, um, the confidence. Yeah. And it's like cool that like her mom instilled that love of writing and books and everything else just into her so strongly that she was like, heck yeah, I'm going to go submit my work at 13 to publishers. It's really cool. Um but writing was her passion, obviously, and she realized this when her mother suggested that she could be a writer. Um, she knew it was a career option, but she just knew she liked writing. She never really thought of it as a, something that she could like make her life around. Uh, and then her mom suggested, like, you could be a writer. And she's like, what? Okay, yeah, I want to do that 100%. Um, so after that moment, being a writer is what Octavia wanted. Her mother brought her bought her her first typewriter, which was a portable Remington. Uh, and apparently her family wasn't the most supportive, unfortunately, in her pursuing writing as a career. Her mother was the most accepting of it, but many people didn't see writing as a practical app. Many people didn't see writing as a practical occupation. Her mother wanted her to get a job as a secretary and be able to sit while working, which considering how Octavia's mom spent the most of her life working on her feet with her hands, that like she wanted her daughter to have a more relaxing career experience um, and something that was really interesting to her, but also like paid a good amount of money. Um, so there were times in her life where she could have pursued those kinds of careers, but they just didn't interest her. The article accounts an interview with Jane Burkett where Butler stated that those careers all sounded like levels of hell to me. Um, it was Butler's experiences with other people as well that influenced her desire to write. Something that I thought was super interesting, although sad, was that she really felt out of place as a kid and didn't relate to her peers. There were times when she was bullied by other kids until she learned to fight back, but she didn't like doing so because she didn't enjoy hurting other people, which very much reminds me of the hyper-empathy and parable of the sower. Um, in fact, a handful of things I read in the article reminded me of Lauren from Parable and the Sower in the way that Octavia spoke about her life. So I'm sure there's probably some overlap there. As we said before, uh, you can't really separate the art from the artist. Like your personality and your views and who you are overflows into what you write. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm here. In fact, a handful of things I read in this article reminded me of Lauren in Parable of the Sower in the way that Octavia spoke about her life, specifically her understanding of her perception of her appearance and how others would masculinize her uh, and her physical traits. This is something Lauren spoke of and even used to her advantage when traveling north, um, disguising herself as a man because it was safer. Uh, the opinions of other people did bother Octavia a lot, and she described adolescence as the one time in her life when she actually felt suicidal. Um, this influenced her to isolate herself and not engage with people her age, and it also affected her desire to escape through books, libraries, and writing. Uh, it was a place where she could create a different world, as well as make sense of a society and how people act. In an interview in 1997, she spoke on these experience, experiences and how that pushed her to write. Uh, she says, because of this, because I was so ostracized and because I was so shy, writing was a real re refuge for me. 
So in that sense, I guess you could say my body helped make me a writer. Um, this influenced how she looked, took in the world as well. Um, when between projects, she would spend a lot of time at the library and would browse through sections she'd never been in before. If she found something interesting, she would take it home and read it. But if there wasn't anything interesting, she'd put it away after a few pages, but she would intentionally find sections of the library that like she had never been before to see different genres and experience different styles of writing. All this tied back to kind of honing in on their literary skills. So one thing that's like really cool about Octavia is that like literally almost everything she did kind of tied back to her overall dream of wanting to be a writer. Um, spending time alone didn't bother Octavia so much as she got older and she was able to accept herself the way that she is. Um, she says, I like spending most of my time alone. I enjoy people best if I can be alone much of the time. I used to worry about it because my family worried about it. And then I finally realized this is the way I am. That's that. We all have some weirdness and this is mine. Um, Octavia apparently also had dyslexia and claimed that this caused her to read very slowly. Uh, she would need to read slowly enough to be able to hear the words in her mind and picture things. So they fell in love with audio tapes for this reason. Uh, Butler said to Charles Rowell in 1997, describing their love of audio tapes, I find it delightful. I learned so much, much more and better if I hear tapes. I recall when I was a little girl being read to by my mother. Even though she was doing the domestic work that I talked about, she would, during my very early years, read to me at night, and I loved it. It was, again, theater to the mind. Um, as someone who has a similar struggle with reading in that I also read very slowly, more from a cognitive processing standpoint, um, but it's just neat to know that Octavia Butler and I have something in common. Um, I also read Parable the Sower and Talents using audiobook. So uh, that's yeah, like, it's so awesome. Yeah, <laughs> She's she like, really, oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so good. It's so mm -hmm. good. No, exactly. Um, and I mean, it was like, it seems similar that like schooling kind of like ruins the love of reading initially, initially, because it's all done for like tests and strict time limits. And it's like way easier to read spark notes if you're reading for that reason, instead of just like, I love books. I want to learn stuff. Um, so it was really through the series, honestly, that restored my love of reading. And it was eBooks that made it so that I was able to read. So it's almost like accessibility is important or something. What? I know, right? It's so crazy. Um, but as Octavia got older, they discovered different styles of writing as well as their like niche. Octavia got into science fiction after watching the movie Devil Girl from Mars and thought she could write a better story than that. Uh, after watching it, she was like, I could do better than that. And I'm going to do that, that all the time. Exactly. <laughs> so it's just like, I could write a better book or book than this person. So I'm going to go do that. Um, so she turned the movie off and just started writing. Um, so Gabe, next time you feel that, you should just stop what you're just doing. Just do it. Yeah. You should write stuff. Uh, <sighs> Call me out. Yeah. So that was the first time they tried to write science fiction. Um, and it's what activated her career was when, uh, like after this, she was admitted into the open door program at the Screenwriters Guild. And in this program, she met one of her mentors and friends, Harlan Ellison. Uh, Ellison encouraged Octavia to attend the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop, where they met Samuel R. Delaney, who was another one of their mentors. Uh, from attending the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop, they sold their first short story, Crossover, to the Clarion Journal, and it was published in 1970. After the success, they were unable to get anything published for five more years. So during this time, Octavia entered into an array of odd jobs to support herself, specifically like washing dishes, sweeping floors, going through a warehouse, inventory sorting potato chips, and so on. Um, this is actually something that I read was also incorporated in Kindred and the many jobs that they had. A lot of the jobs that they mention are jobs that Octavia actually worked herself. So that's kind of cool. Um, in the meantime, in this five-year period where you know they're struggling to get stuff published, every night at 2 or 3 a.m., they woke up and just started writing which is crazy. <laughs> but uh, the article specifically says, Butler liked to write in the early hours of the morning when it was still dark out. This was true for the 10 years that she worked temporary jobs between 1968 and 1978. Although she purchased a computer in later years, she still preferred writing on a typewriter. She loved writing when it rained. Later on in her career, she would come up with a routine, taking a walk between 5.30 and 6.30 a.m., doing work around the house, 
sitting down to write at 9 a.m. and cutting time out later in the day to read. So as I said, honestly, like everything that they did looped back to their love of writing, which is just very cool. And also the dedication to wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning to write. And it's, I think it kind of ties back to the fact that sleep isn't real. (laughs) like our sleep schedule like it isn't real so if you feel awake just get up and do something that's going to make you tired instead of staring at the ceiling yep like be proactive about it yeah so that's what Octavia did at two three in the morning she was like I'm all right um but this all kind of shifted uh her kind of doing odd jobs and having to put like the writing time at two in the morning all shifted when they got fired from one of their jobs in 1974 and they decided to take the plunge. Um, Novel writing seemed really intimidating because of the length, but Octavia kind of shifted her perspective on how to approach it through looking at every chapter as if it was a short story. And with this method, she finished Pattern Master within months. Uh, She submitted the novel to Doubleday and it was published in 1976. After this, her career really started to take off. She published four novels, one per year, and in 1980 published Wild Seed. Uh, The early novels from Butler were the same stories that she had in her mind at the age of 12, which is why she was able to complete them so quickly. Um, And also it's like really just like a neat fun fact. Like this is stuff she has been thinking about since she was 12 years old um, and turned them into novels, like never let go of those ideas and published I mean, obviously refined, but it's just kind of cool. The ones that followed were created from her adult mind. So they took a little bit more time to unpack. Uh, Octavia Butler wrote 12 novels and nine short stories in her lifetime. Well, they got published specifically. Her life experiences were integrated into her writing. And these experiences are what made many of these books so amazing. Um, Their perspectives on the world are something very unique and powerful. In the Book Riot article, they said that Butler taught, and when she taught, she told her students, if something didn't kill you, you would probably wind up using it in your writing. This reminds me of the, in our F the Patriarchy series where we spoke about how who we are always are is always in our art. You can't separate them. Um, or to quote Parable of the Sower, all you touch, you change. All you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Um, On Octavia Butler's website, there is an overview of their impact. Uh, While they passed on February 24th, 2006, it was during this time that their books actually really started to rise. And in recent years, their sales have increased enormously because of their relevance today. Octavia's work is taught in over 200 colleges and universities nationwide. Apparently, Ava DuVernay is developing uh, a novel, the novel Dawn, into a television series. Um, That is so exciting. Right. Um, And there's apparently also an opera based on Butler's novel Parable of the Sower that was a part of the public theater under the Radar Festival and toured worldwide in 2018. Also pretty neat. Um, Also, Amazon Studios and Juvie Productions, which is Viola Davis and Julius Tennant's production company, are developing a drama series from Butler's Patternist series, beginning with Wild Seed. And the series is being co-written by Nettie Akorafor and Winori Kahui, uh, who will be also directing that. So that's also very exciting. The last thing I kind of want to say about Octavia is that they won a lot of awards, and that's really cool. So between uh, 1980 and 2018, they won 12 awards, which is huge. Um, it seems that luckily most of the awards that they did receive did happen during their actual like time of being alive. Three of them, not. Uh, but most recently they won the Eisner Award for Best Ad- Adaptation from another medium for Kindred, um, which is specifically the, uh, the comic version of it, um, because I guess it got them recognized in different mediums and also the art. Is pretty mm. cool. Um, in two, cool. Yeah, in 2012, they won a Solstice Award for Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers in America. 2010, they were the inductee Science Fiction Hall of Fame. Um, and they won a lot of other awards specifically for novel novels. So they won multiple awards for Best Novelette, um, which is just really awesome. And they also got a MacArthur Genius Grant, which is pretty nice. cool. Nice. Um, but yeah, they're really awesome. That's the moral of the story. 
It's my two cents. <laughs> You're sticking to it. Yeah. Yeah, I love hearing about her life and just like it is super inspiring. And I feel like even though some of her works can be so depressing, <laughs> there's yeah. also like a line of hope in in mm-hmm. like possibility because even though she was like very aware and like that like she was triggered and um by events that were happening in real life to mm-hmm. do something about it um but it was like it wasn't like oh my god this is awful everyone needs to know about it it was oh my god this is awful everyone needs to know about it so we can do something about it yeah and i think that's also just like the lens that changes where it's like black people in america have known america has been horrible for a really long time People mm-hmm. who have been looking at humanity for as long as humanity is like, know that it's been horrible forever. Like, it's not news, you know? It's not like, wow, suddenly everything is the worst. Yeah. Uh, so you have, like, a different angle to it that is honestly significantly better and more productive in that it's not just, like, doom and gloom. The world is ending now. The world mm-hmm. has been ending this entire time. So continue to try to change it. And that's something I really love about Parable of the Sower because it's, like, so depressing but also – so like actionable and like empowering where you're like yeah everything sucks but we can actively do stuff yeah (laughs) and it's like feels so much like our show (laughs) like such an uh you know inspiration and I will say I also love hearing that like you know over 200 colleges teach her works because that's when I was first introduced to her was in college um we had to read it we had to read kindred for a Mm -hmm. class and I was floored I was like, I had no idea she existed. I loved that teacher. I hate that I can't remember his name right now. And I just really enjoyed this exploration. It was like one of my first forays into like Afrofuturism or just like um, black speculative fiction. And so Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was like, whoa, that's there. That exists. Like this whole time I wasn't, no one told me about it. And I think I wrote my whole paper about um, Octavia Butler specifically and like writing like other writers like her mm-hmm. writing that. Cause I was like, this is too cool. Everyone needs to talk about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, Oh my God, what are we doing? Um, oh, yeah. And that's just cause I came from a very sheltered world. So. Yeah. Well, that's or also that's why we're doing <laughs> the series. It's so cool. And everyone should know about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, now that I know how though I can read in this medium, and I'm really thankful for this series for that reason. In that I'm like, wow, I can, I, I can read. <laughs> Which sounds silly, but it's like, I really could only read online. So like, I was like, I don't know. I can't read book books because they hurt my eyes and they make my neck hurt from looking down. There's like a handful of reasons. I don't remember what's being said, but accessibility features like the internet and like audiobooks make it so that's possible. So now I'm like a huge Octavia Butler fan. I want to read everything they've ever written ever and a bunch of other books probably from the series. So I agree. I'm trying to see who reads who narrates um the books the books and if anything you're reading it in the chosen way that Octavia would have loved the most because you're reading many books the so the audiobook that I'm reading uh Parable of the Sower and Talents is narrated by Lynn Thigpen and they're amazing and in the in Parable of the Talents because there's three voices that you're hearing you're hearing Lauren her daughter and then um their husband and so uh every now and again there's like two other voice actors who are in there but the primary one like it's fin- it's phenomenal <laughs> it's yeah. so good it's like Lauren Oya Olamina I'm like oh my god so cool um yeah. <laughs> so I get very excited and um I will say like similar to her growing up my love of books started because uh I had an aunt who would read books to me at night um and we actually read Harry Potter but I like having her and having that connection like that was our thing that she would read to me at night and like being able to hear the story and envision it I was like whoa books are really cool yeah (laughs) books are awesome scientific like that's like one of the highest leading ways to get someone to read is to read to them and children they get read to are like twice as more likely to like one learn how to read developmentally Mm -hmm. appropriate time but also we'll like have a love of books um that is deeper than if you just never get read to uh it's apparently science which is Mm -hmm. cool yeah i used to read to my sister she loved it um yeah 
favorite <laughs> book was James and the Giant Peach. Mm. Their favorite story. Um, all right, throw me up there, cat. Do it. So, so um, I wanted to talk about in the in this episode because like next week we'll be talking about actual. Um, we're going to be focusing on parable of the sower and talents, um, and just some of those themes and things that are happening. But I wanted to talk about Octavia Butler overall and like what her impact is in the writing world, but also like what she focused on when she was creating and um, like how those come through. These themes come through in all of her different writings. So um, essentially Octavia Butler is a staple of science fiction and Afrofuturism, which if you are unfamiliar, Afrofuturism is a movement in literature, music, art, etc., that features futuristic or science fiction themes, which incorporate mm -hmm. elements of black history and culture. Um, Octavia looked to highlight the horrors of our present world's oppressive system. She tackles slavery, white supremacy, capitalism, climate change, fascism, religious fundamentalism, and more <laughs> always uh, in Lovelace. little bits and everything it. right yeah. and she has been even called the mother of Afrofuturism and has inspired many black science fiction writers today and she is known for her ability to write terrifyingly prescient stories that uh, are able to grab like real world horrors of her time and make predictions of our outcomes they're like too real <laughs> Times yeah. or I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> so in 1993, Octavia published Parable of the Sower, and it's a dystopian future tale set in the not too distant future of 2024. Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow. The world she builds is one of fierce hopelessness and forced resistance. Gas prices make vehicles nearly obsolete. Uh, people find themselves enslaved by companies to make ends meet. Drugged communities set fire to towns in desire to destroy the rich. Police are expensive and help only the rich. Jobs are nearly non-existent. Religious groups take control of the government. And education is impossible. Mm -hmm. hmm. <laughs> Sounds really familiar. Um, yeah. <laughs> Industry towns, you know, they're trying to make a comeback. Oh, it's, it's, real, it's like modern slavery. Maybe they'll work this time, Gabe. Sorry to bother you. Definitely inspired <laughs> by Octavia Butler, for sure. This yeah. uh, futuristic hellscape feels a bit too close for comfort when reading in today's political climate. And further in her sequel, Parable of the Talents, there's a right-wing conservative and Christian political leader who's running for presidential office and has used the slogan, Make America Great Again. Honestly? 93. And, and yeah. to be fair, that is because it has been a phrase that has been used previously. So Trump was not the first to think of this. Um, yeah. But this Jarrett, the character who is running under that and the pe more so not even just that character, because he's actually kind of smart. <laughs> Trump is not smart. But there are little things that like I'll talk about next week. But it's really more for me, the followers of Jarrett that feel yeah. very, very realistic to what we have for followers of Trump. But one of my favorite things about talents and favorite, I mean, it was horrifying was when they were voting, um, you know, they voted for the other guy who wasn't Jared, who was a former or current vice president. And okay. uh, they <laughs> voted for him and they were like, we didn't want to vote for him, but we had to. And it was better to have a man who had nothing in his head than a man who can destroy the planet. So I was like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Oh, oh no. no. So what just freaking happened to me? Like, I didn't want to. Okay. I was like, Octavia. Uh, I Octavia. Saw <laughs> Octavia, so please, why'd you do this to me? Um, so That's amazing. Uh, but furthermore, like, not just these, her, like, what I really love about it is, like, she does, like, there are those horrifying things that I think. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have been referencing, especially now, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade and other societal issues that are coming to light. They're like, oh, my gosh, like, <laughs> Octavia has been telling you about this for a long time. Like, she's told you about yeah. it already. But I think on top of that, there is, like, there's all these horrifying real-life things that are happening. But there's also this thread of what it means to be human and exploring, like, humanity overall that comes through in all of her works that comes mm -hmm. from a really genuine place of not, like, hate it gets never yeah. like, like these places and people in power, like they're messed up. It's awful. But there's also good 
And so it's kind of like, there's yeah. an option. We can do something about it. And so I think it's, it's interesting because she's also explored what it means to be human, like our flaws, our biases and our successes. And she forces us to confront our history and our potential future. Um, in Dawn, which is her uh, science fiction uh, trilogy under Lilith's brood and the only science fiction book I've ever been able to stomach like in the read and be like, Oh, this is actually really cool. And I'll be like, who is, I don't care. <laughs> I don't need the white man savior for the whole galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> Cannot stand it. So Dawn highly recommend, even if you don't like sci-fi, cause I'm not a big sci-fi person like that. Amazing. And in yeah. Dawn, she has a protagonist, Lilith Ayapo, who wakes aboard a ship that belongs to the Owen Kali, which is a breed of alien that had rescued her and other humans from the uninhabitable Earth, a world that was made deadly by our own wars and hate. Yes. Hmm. Uh, the Owen Kali diagnose humans. This is my favorite part. <laughs> this is the part that like stuck with me. Like, the rest of the book was like a lot of things happening, but I couldn't get over this. So the Owen Kali diagnosed humans with the incurable defect of hegemony. Yeah. So our desire and need to have caste systems, people in power and rankings of any sort have guaranteed our downfall. They were like, it's in your genes. You will. Yeah. The reason why all of your civilizations have fallen is because you have ranked each other. You have had a sense of superiority instead of equality and you've brought about your own destruction because of that when you could yeah, just love each other and there's no way out of it <laughs> so our only chance of avoiding another world ending fate like we had before the book takes place would be to actually breed children with the Owen Kali which would prompt the next step in our evolution and ensure um, that we'll have grounded beings who can be equal to one another which is also like it, again, it brings out like, what does it mean to be human? Are we still human if we're half a Wankali? <laughs> like, it, like yeah. is that okay? Um, are we still human if we're not like, you know, hegemonic beings? Like what, what does that mean? And so that just like, because <laughs> you're thinking like, oh, they ha we have a defect. What is it? You're going to tell me the scientific thing. And it was like, it's because you guys all like have a caste system and you think you're better than other people and you're all the same. And I yeah. was like, okay. <laughs> You got me. You got me there. Um, in Kindred, which I mentioned uh, I had read in college, Octavia's protagonist, Dana, is a 1970s um, feminist Black woman who is transported back in time and is then forced to protect her white ancestor on the slave plantation. And if mm. she doesn't, she will be erased for good. So there's a lot <laughs> to unpack in that story, but she, uh, Dana really grapples with these expectations and must reckon with her history, the history of this country and the impact it had on her modern living. Um, mm -hmm. She also has a white husband in it who goes back in time at some point, And there's a lot of like conversations and thoughts that are pretty interesting and uh, a way to kind of look at how we view um, activism today <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like who we're putting our trust in uh very interesting and again still like from a place of hope like we have to just yeah. reckon with the fact that those things happened and now we can move forward and do better right yeah. um in blood child she introduces us to a boy tasked with giving birth which is dismantling and confronting our expectations of birth gender identity and motherhood in wild seed sex changing and shape-shifting characters steer the narrative so always against what we are expecting, especially in this genre, um, really can forcing us to look at our world, how we see the world, how we see ourselves in the world, and how we see our heroes, yeah. honestly, at the heart of it. And um, because her stories often feature strong femme protagonists who confront society's expectations of them while dismantling the oppressive ideologies that seek to hold them back, simply by existing and refusing to back down. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, most often these protagonists were strong, intelligent black women who encountered communities that doubted their abilities. Like, no, of course you can't do that. Um, mm -hmm. And for a variety of reasons. And without pushing back aggressively against these thoughts, um, they instead prove their knowledge and power through actions and patience. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just by doing, people are like, oh, wait, actually, <laughs> I think you know what you're doing. It seems mm -hmm. you got it together. And now I have to rethink why I thought that about you. Um, and for genres that often center on whiteness, chosen one archetypes, and rely on hearers of certain demographics, uh, straight, 
<laughs> Octavia yeah. breaks many walls simply by being a voice in this genre. With Afrofuturism or Black speculative fiction, there is the intention to create and share worlds in which BIPOC people and cultures aren't erased. Yeah. Um, she had the nerve to envision a future where we still exist the audacity where we can be the heroes and villains and where we can be the answer um, at the risk of being written out of the future creators and writers like Octavia fought to write themselves back in and to not be reduced to background characters laborers or step stools for white heroes to perch upon and succeed um, mm -hmm. which is so important and I'm so thankful to her for this so in an article that I found on Princeton University's uh, library site titled Afrofuturism how Octavia Butler is moving us forward by Julie Melby, they explain her messages saying, beginning in the 1970s, her narratives upended the primarily white male dominant genre of science fiction occupied by George Orwell, H.G. Wells, and Ray Bradbury by introducing heroines such as Parable's Lauren Olamina, a 15 year old black girl who dares to undertake a perilous journey to make a new home for herself and her multiracial, multi general gender followers. Through Lauren, Butler tells us to embrace diversity, unite, or be divided, robbed, ruled, killed by those who see you as prey. Embrace diversity or be destroyed. Um, which reminds me of, uh, I believe it was Adrian Marie Brown, who was saying like, we got to rotate the crops <laughs> of storytelling <laughs> or our land's going to die, right? So it's just like, the only answer is to evolve, right? Is to mm -hmm. accept each other, to work together. If that means the Owen Collie get in here, the Owen Collie get in here, and we get to live. We get to keep going. Yeah. Um, in her Patternist series, uh, which starts with the Wild Seed, with Wild Seed, she started writing when she was very young, as Kat was explaining, uh, and it ended up being her first novel. But she actually wrote the story backward. Uh, she started with the Pattern Master, and that's the quote unquote end of the series and then worked backwards to discover the origin story and how did we get there to that story. Um, yeah. Her writing was an outlet for her own troubles and a way to sort through her feelings in a dark world and find some peace of light and seeing what was happening around her drove her to ask questions such as what do we do to stop this? How can we convince others to change and what happens if it keeps happening? And this outlet yeah. was her offer to help others with those very issues. And her works not only inspired new fiction writers, but also social activists who wanted to apply these lessons in the real world. Activists such as Adrienne Marie Brown, who co-edited an anthology of science fiction stories inspired by Octavia Butler titled Octavia's Brood, uses Octavia's lessons and implements them into her own strategies for change and community organizing. Um, so like you were saying, Kat, like <laughs> there's actionable items in the fiction so yeah. there's actual people who are like well actually we could use all of these things to do something yeah. right now um Makes society. <laughs> yeah and octavia's work still influenced creators today and her existence in the field made room for others such as tana 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 reeve tana reeve there we go such as tana reeve uh do from uh horror noir and uh adrian marie brown uh to follow behind she once said if I hadn't written, I probably would have done something stupid that would have led to my death. And well, without her, our destiny amongst the stars may have never been known. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I got. Nice. Cool. Love to stay. Yeah. Um, kind of parts of this is that, uh, you know, I have read a few of her books I have many to finish <laughs> like I'm finishing mm -hmm. up Parable of the Talents um I read Dawn and I intend to read the rest of the like I have adulthood rights and um I have Wild Seed I just haven't <laughs> embarked on it yet uh yeah. there's so many and I it, well, now we have this writer series so I gotta make sure I read everything else and some of them are taking a lot of time uh but mm -hmm. I will say that like Dawn is so awesome in just like for me, it was very digestible as someone who can't really get over the lingo. And like, it's such a created world that's so different from what we usually have in, in when you're reading a science fiction that mm -hmm. it like drives me crazy because I'm like, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> so I'm like struggling. So even though I didn't know what everything means, uh, she takes a lot of care to explain things. And like mm -hmm. some people might find that annoying, but I thought I was very thankful for it. I enjoyed yeah. the own Kali. I thought it was like 
really interesting the way that they were portrayed. It was very smart, these aliens yeah. that exist. Like, it made sense to me biologically. <laughs> they yeah. would exist. I'm just so fascinated by them. And um, really the exploration of people and what it means to be a human and what we do when we're really confronted with the possibility of us dying off. Yeah. I really want to read all of them, honestly. Like, I've only read one at this point. And it was like the quickest book I've ever re read, ever in life. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm like, anything by Octavia. I also want to read Octavia's Brood now, too. That, like, mm -hmm. that, that exists. That as well. Yeah, I'm going to have to read it. Yeah. It's and there's neat. just a bunch of, like, other sci fi writers um, who were inspired by her. So you can see, like, her legacy and see mm -hmm. the impact that it had. And I think, like, so important about our characters really was, like, you know, we love a good, you know, burn it down story. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Um, but I love that hers is like, we burn it down when that's like the last option. But mm -hmm. before that is like, we kind of rise above. And yeah, there are things to action. do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we don't always get that in such a beautiful way. Like, you know, yeah. like we can respect. Like, it doesn't feel like a cop out. It feels intentional. Well, yeah. And it's also like the villains aren't these like, crazy over the top things like a lot of the time or at least in parable of the third like it's just people like people being people like they're it's not like one person is like well so, sometimes one person is worse than somebody else but it's like oh, a lot of the time it's just like humans humaning mm -hmm. surviving being awful and that, that that's just like what is instead of something crazy some like big bad monstrous thing that actually doesn't mean anything yeah well it's like when we you know we're talking about zombie films right like mm -hmm. zombies are there they're scary but really those are the people right and so yeah. i think that's really what's interesting about hers is that it really comes down to like humans are the villain and the heroes yeah. and so you really have to like choose which lane you're in and they're so realistic especially parable of sower and talents it's like that's i know that person <laughs> and thinking like how would i react would i do this how do i yeah. feel and um i'm like i'm not done with talents and i'm at a really stressful sad part and i'm like oh no <laughs> so yeah. just a heads up it gets really stressful um yeah well like, it's no. like the idea of being a good person is like it's not a static sense of being you're not born a good part like you actually have to work on it mm -hmm. and I think that's like a theme that I definitely picked up on yeah. like throughout it was really interesting yeah I think Lauren is often working through that and in yeah. talents because we're hearing from other characters and we get mm -hmm. to see through somebody else's eyes what Lauren looks like is even better because now it's like she's just a person yeah she's a human it's like when Guess you realize what? your parents are people. Yeah. 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 There's a um, like, John Steinbeck quote about that, like realizing your parents are humans and it's like the gods have fallen kind of drama mm -hmm. um, that I always was like, yeah, that's so real. Um, and it's funny because I grew up reading Ray Bradbury, um, George Orwell, H.G. Wells, and didn't know about her. And I... <laughs> will say like if I had and I grew up and I saw characters that were like Lauren or Dana like and could find myself in them I think I would have probably read science fiction earlier and more yeah and um, like maybe enjoyed it more too because mm -hmm. I was like okay cool whatever yeah. <laughs> I was like whatever this guy was <laughs> white man all right look at that hero again uh, <laughs> what is this a metaphor for cool that's great yeah. uh yeah so 10 out of 10, I, I'm so happy that we're starting out this series with Octavia Butler. I really hope it inspires you to read more of her work or read her work, period. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is very easily digestible. There are some really horrifying things that happen, especially in Parable of the Sower, but you can get through it. Um, if you have a weak yeah. stomach, then I recommend um, Dawn. It's not as tough. It's, yeah. yeah. A lot of the bad has already happened <laughs> by the time we get to dawn that it's more like a introspective kind of yeah, experience. Like what would happen hundreds of years from now or even like not yeah. so much that but like soon or but yeah. not while it's in transition yeah i really yeah. want to read um 
the shape shifting one. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, I will say this if you enjoy um, Afrofuturism or genre work written about and uh, uh, by BIPOC creators, then you should check out Black Women Are Scary, which is an audio drama podcast that I do sound design on. It is. Um, <laughs> produced by Dusky Projects, which is under Wimoto Nayoka, who has been a guest on our show twice, three times maybe. Um, <laughs> you know, the three times. Uh, and it's amazing. Each uh, story is written by a BIPOC author. Um, it is uh, voice acted by a BIPOC uh, actor. And then, again, sound designed by me most of the time, <laughs> at least the second and third season. And mm-hmm. they're really amazing works. And so if you want to see yourself reflected and just existing, it's literally like, we're not, not everything is like, oh, we have these overarching political theories. It's just like, we just have the audis- audacity to also exist in these fantastical worlds. Mm-hmm. Oh, we're also a vampire hunter. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know you could do that? <laughs> what? Yeah. So <laughs> like, oh, we also have fairy magic powers. Like, what are like... So um, if you like it, highly recommend that as a, as a good listen, especially if you like listening to um, books. And it we go a step further because we put the whole world in it and we put mm-hmm. sound effects. Um, I bet Octavia Butler would have loved it. Yeah. Genuinely. <laughs> so yeah. uh, and just read books by Wimoto if you want. Um, yeah. Well, that I think that's a great start to our series. Next week, you'll hear more about Parable the Sower and mm-hmm. a little bit about talents. I don't want to spoil talents. too much with Kat. I got to the end. Like, I literally have 36 pages of Handmaid's Tale left. So I was going to start talents tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. And if I read it fast enough, which I read Parable the Sower in like two days of nonstop reading time. If I do that again, I think I can do it. <laughs> Yeah, do so, like she did. Wake up two a.m. Read. Yeah, th- th- that doesn't happen for me. I sleep no. all the way through the night unless I've had some sort of very horrifying nightmare, to which I wake up for two seconds and then immediately fall asleep again. Um, yeah, that's I'm good. I read all the time, reading all the time, and I'm a um, nighttime person, sleep time. <laughs> if you are uh, watching, if you're following us on TikTok, I'm going to start doing some book reviews there, make a little book talk series. Mm-hmm. So uh, you can check us out, and I'll share some other books that I've been reading that I enjoy, and might talk about certain authors. Might not. We'll see how it goes. Mm-hmm. This is kind of like in, in addition to if you're looking for book recs. I got yeah. you. Also, drop your recommendations. Remember to like and subscribe. Give us a rating if you haven't. Let us know mm-hmm. your thoughts on Activia in our uh, comments on YouTube or something. Um, yeah. I'm sure you love her. I can't imagine anyone who doesn't. Yeah. And <laughs> if you do, I'm going to have like, some questions. But uh, if you have some recommendations, if you're like, if Please. you like Octavia Butler, then you would like X, Y, Z. Love it. We love that recommendation. I read now. So I actively want to talk about books all the time now. It's like become one of my special interests. I didn't know that this Octavia Butler's books made me love reading again. So if you have anything even remotely similar and you want to talk about it even, or just tell me about it so that I can read it now, I would love you forever. And we can walk off into the sunset reading books. Yes. Please. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Well, don't get married. Look at your kids. Where your kids will bury acorns in mm-hmm. the ground, sad that you're gone forever. Yeah. Make some acorn bread. It's fine. Yeah, it's good. <laughs>